Lavinia Fisher, a name echoing through the annals of history, lies veiled in shadows, shrouded in sinister deeds. Infamous for her malevolent actions, Lavinia prowled the streets of Charleston like a specter of terror, luring unsuspecting travelers into her web of deceit. With a beguiling smile and captivating charm, she ensnared her victims, leading them to their doom in her sinister lair, where lethal spikes, poisoned tea, and beds rigged with fatal traps awaited them. Behind her facade of beauty lay a heart as black as night, orchestrating horrors that would haunt the darkest corners of the mind for centuries to come. Such was the enigma of Lavinia Fisher in Charleston in the 1800s, a figure of terror and fascination whose legacy continues to send shivers down the spines of those who dare to delve into her grim past. In the early 1800s, Charleston, nestled in South Carolina, was a bustling port city and economic hub of the American South. Founded in 1670, Charleston had grown into one of the largest and wealthiest cities in the United States by the 19th century due to its strategic location for trade and commerce. As a major port city, Charleston attracted traders and merchants from around the world, making it a vibrant center of economic activity. Its bustling waterfront was filled with ships carrying goods as well as slaves brought from Africa to work on the plantations of the surrounding region. During this era, inns played a crucial role in supporting the influx of travelers and traders into Charleston. Situated outside the city limits, these inns served as vital rest stops for weary travelers arriving by horse or wagon, providing them with essential amenities such as food, lodging, and stabling for their horses. Given the risks of highwaymen and bandits along the roads leading into and out of Charleston, these inns also offered a degree of safety and security for travelers and their valuable cargo. The names of these inns often reflected their location relative to the city, serving as mile markers for travelers on their journey. While the primary purpose of these inns was to provide practical necessities for travelers, they also served as social and commercial hubs where locals and visitors alike could gather, trade goods, and engage in various activities, including gambling and poker games. Among the array of such inns dotting the landscape was one owned by a seemingly respectable couple, Lavinia Fisher and John Fisher, yet behind their facade of hospitality lurked a myriad of sinister secrets shrouded within their seemingly caring personas. Lavinia Fisher's early life remains a tapestry woven with elusive threads, leaving historians grappling with the enigma of her origins. Born in 1793, she entered the world as an enchanting presence, described as a woman of considerable beauty accentuated by her alluring hair color, however the intricate layers of her childhood remain shrouded in obscurity, with scant documentation offering glimpses into her upbringing, familial ties, or the circumstances of her birthplace. Yet, it is her indelible imprint on the annals of South Carolina's history that thrusts her into the spotlight. The lack of historical records about her has contributed to the mystique surrounding her, with some accounts suggesting that she seemingly appeared fully formed upon her marriage to John Fisher in the early 19th century. Despite the absence of concrete details about her early years, it is believed that Lavinia spent much of her life in the United States, possibly near Charleston. In the midst of her mysterious origins, Lavinia found a partnership in the early 1900s with John Fisher, a seemingly caring man, and together, the couple forged a path into the hospitality industry, establishing an inn aimed at accommodating weary travelers. Nestled within the serene landscapes of their locale, their establishment became a beacon of respite for those journeying through the region. Amidst the warm glow of hospitality, the Fishers cultivated an atmosphere of comfort and welcome, offering solace to travelers from far and wide who sought refuge within the walls of their inn. Their inn, known as the Six Mile Wayfarer House or simply the Six Mile House, was located approximately six miles outside of Charleston, thus giving it its name. Lavinia often used her attractive traits to her advantage in both the Fishers' business endeavors and within the local community. Her allure helped her attract attention and popularity to the inn, making it one of the most popular and favorite stops for travelers passing through the area, however unknown to unsuspecting people, her affable demeanor and charming personality actually served as a facade for her sinister intentions. As the proprietress of the Six Mile Wayfarer House, Lavinia employed cunning methods to target and dispatch her victims at the inn, while the pair's modus operandi involved targeting wealthy individuals traveling alone. 
She would lure such guests into the inn with affability, offering them dinner and engaging them in lengthy conversation, subtly probing them about their wealth and possessions, and using each interaction as an opportunity to assess their potential as targets for robbery. If deemed suitable targets, she would offer her unsuspecting guests a cup of poison tea before bedtime, however the legends surrounding Lavinia diverge regarding the fate of the poison victims. In one version, the fishers waited until the toxic tea took effect, rendering the victim unconscious, before entering the room together to fatally stab them. In another more gruesome rendition, the poison tea induced drowsiness, allowing the fishers to wait until the victim was on the brink of sleep. At that moment, they activated a hidden lever that caused the bed to collapse, plunging the victim into a pit below the floorboards, where they met their demise. A high number of accounts even suggest that this pit was equipped with lethal sharpened spikes, which ensured a gruesome and lethal end for their victims. Meanwhile according to a group of historians, Lavinia allegedly used her powerful thighs to crush the heads of those unfortunate enough to cross her path, snuffing out their lives in a macabre display of brutality. Regardless of the specific details, the legends surrounding paint a chilling picture of deception, manipulation, and cold-blooded violence perpetrated under the guise of hospitality. Despite the fishers' deliberate targeting of lone travelers to avoid drawing unwanted attention, rumors and reports circulated within the community regarding missing persons last seen at the Six Mile Wayfarer House. Concerned by these accounts, the local sheriff's office launched an investigation, however despite the suspicions surrounding the fishers and their establishment, authorities struggled to gather sufficient evidence linking them to the disappearances. Unbeknownst to law enforcement, the seemingly charming couple were actively engaged in a vigilante gang committing illegal acts against travelers, including highway robbery and theft of livestock. Their establishment served as a convenient hideout for their criminal activities and was frequented by members of their crew. Frustrated by the lack of official intervention, the citizens of Charleston took matters into their own hands. On February 16, 1819, a well-armed mob, organized as vigilantes, assembled with the intention of putting an end to the lawlessness attributed to the gang of desperados believed to be operating in the area. The exact size of this vigilante group is unspecified, but they reportedly approached several houses suspected of harboring criminals, including one belonging to the Fishers. Invoking Lynch's law, the group descended upon the Five Mile House, ordering its occupants to vacate before setting the building ablaze. Encouraged by their success, they proceeded to the Six Mile Wayfarer House, issuing a similar ultimatum to its inhabitants, you have 15 minutes to vacate or we set the house on fire. The occupants, likely aware of the fate of the Five Mile House, complied, and the mob evacuated them from the premises. After ensuring the occupants had vacated and were convinced of their success, the vigilantes promptly made their way back to Charleston, leaving a man named David Ross behind to keep a vigilant eye for any resurgence of criminal activity. Their departure marked a turning point in the saga, as the shadow of justice seemed to loom large over the once infamous inn. The local newspaper, the Charleston Courier, echoed their triumph, heralding the end of nefarious deeds on Saturday, February 20, 1819, however the following day, Ross found himself violently attacked by the very criminals he had been tasked to watch over. Among these assailants were a man named William Hayward and his partner, who violently confronted Ross and threatened his life. In a desperate plea for assistance, David Ross turned to the reputedly respectable couple Lavinia and John, hoping to find solace in their aid, however his plea for help proved to be a fateful misstep as the situation escalated into a harrowing ordeal. Instead of extending a helping hand, the Fisher couple, accompanied by two men and a woman, became perpetrators in the assault against Ross. The air thickened with tension as loaded whips cracked, inflicting a savage beating upon the unfortunate Ross. Amidst the chaos, Lavinia's hands, once symbols of hospitality, became instruments of brutality as she choked Ross and forcefully thrust his head through a window, sealing his fate in a moment of unfathomable violence. Yet, despite the overwhelming odds against him, Ross managed to escape his captors, displaying remarkable agility and resourcefulness. Upon reaching the safety of Charleston, Ross recounted the harrowing ordeal he endured and the chilling threats and brutality inflicted upon him. 
Amongst the tales of terror, one menacing promise echoed with particular dread, Lavinia's vow of a hundred lashes should fate ever deliver him back into her grasp. Shortly following the harrowing incident, a traveler by the name of John Peoples arrived at the doorstep of the authorities, bearing a chilling testimony of the sinister treatment he had endured at the Fisher's Inn. With a tremor in his voice and fear etched upon his face, Peoples recounted the grim fate that awaited him, a fate destined to be concealed within the shadows of secrecy, unknown to the world at large. According to John's accounts, his encounter at the Fisher Inn began with an unsettling twist of hospitality and deception. Initially turned away due to a purported lack of vacancies, he found himself unexpectedly invited to dinner with Lavinia herself. Engaging in seemingly benign conversation, John soon realized he was under intense scrutiny as Lavinia probed him with probing questions. Suddenly the availability of a room was revealed, but John's instincts whispered warnings of danger. Sensing treachery, he feigned compliance, pretending to partake in the offered tea while discreetly disposing of it. Opting to forego the comfort of the bed, he settled into a wooden chair positioned near the door, a makeshift bastion against the looming shadows of deceit. His cautious instincts proved to be his saving grace, when he awoke abruptly to the jarring sound of his bed collapsing into the darkness below at midnight. With adrenaline coursing through his veins, John wasted no time in seizing the fleeting opportunity for escape, hurling himself through the window into the cool night air, fleeing with haste to the sanctuary of Charleston's embrace. The culmination of the criminal activities orchestrated by Lavinia and John at the Six Mile reached a tipping point, when law enforcement finally intervened following alarming reports from David Ross and John Peoples. Armed with sufficient evidence, police officers were dispatched to the inn, where they encountered a fortified stronghold of the Fisher gang. John and Lavinia, alongside several other accomplices, had barricaded themselves inside, armed with weapons and ready to defend their illicit operations. Despite the armed resistance put up by the occupants, the combined force of law enforcement and vigilant citizens ensured their capture, bringing an end to the reign of terror that had gripped the community. Amidst the chaos, a remarkable display of loyalty emerged, as John Fisher motivated by his love for his wife Lavinia, surrendered his whole group in a desperate bid to shield his wife from harm. The Fisher couple along with James McElroy, Seth Young, and Jane Howard, were apprehended and escorted into a waiting paddy wagon. Their journey to the city jail on Charleston's Magazine Street spanned six miles, each moment marked by the weight of impending justice as they were transported to face the consequences of their alleged crimes. Following their arrest, the thorough search conducted by law enforcement at the Six Mile Inn and its surroundings revealed a disturbing array of evidence implicating the Fishers in a multitude of heinous crimes. The discovery of hidden passages and underground tunnels highlighted the extent of the Fisher's elaborate scheme to evade detection while carrying out their illicit activities. These clandestine routes purportedly not only allowed them to move stealthily throughout the property, but also, according to some urban legends, facilitated the abduction and disposal of their victims without raising suspicion. The recovery of personal items belonging to numerous missing travelers provided damning proof of the Fisher's involvement in their disappearances. Their thorough investigation yielded another startling discovery, the hide of a slaughtered cow, through which speculation arose among the posse members that this hide likely belonged to the cow, reported missing just days prior. Furthermore, the unearthing of the tools used by the Fishers to execute their sinister deeds shed light on the meticulous planning and execution that went into their criminal enterprise. The poison-laced tea intended to incapacitate their unsuspecting victims and the mechanism designed to ensnare them in a deadly trap underscored the calculated cruelty and ruthlessness of the Fishers' methods. The discovery of the macabre scene sent shockwaves through the community, eliciting horror and revulsion at the monstrous crimes committed by the Fishers. With the grim task of scouring the premises completed, a somber decision was made to purge the land of its dark legacy. In a final act of closure and symbolic justice, Six Mile House and its surrounding buildings were engulfed in flames, reduced to smoldering ashes that obscured the horrors witnessed within their walls. Ultimately, the revelations unearthed during the search solidified the Fisher's legacy as among the most notorious and reviled criminals in history.
The legend surrounding Lavinia continued to swell with chilling tales of horror fueled by a harrowing revelation that shook the community to its core. Rumors spread like wildfire, recounting the discovery of a hidden basement concealed within the depths of the Fisher Inn. Within its grim confines lay the ghastly remains of over a hundred individuals, their silent screams echoing through the annals of history. This macabre chamber stood as a somber testament to the staggering toll exacted by the Fisher Gang, laying bare the true extent of their savagery and moral decay, however despite the widespread dissemination of this ominous tale, concrete evidence to substantiate such claims remained elusive, leaving the veracity of the legend shrouded in uncertainty. The period between the Fisher's arrest and their execution was marked by legal proceedings, strategic planning, and a failed escape attempt, spanning nearly a year. Despite maintaining their innocence, John and Lavinia were ordered to remain in jail until their trial due to the gravity of the charges against them. Meanwhile their accomplices were released on bail, adding to the tension surrounding the case. The trial in May of 1819 dealt a significant blow to the Fisher's hopes for acquittal, as the jury found them guilty of highway robbery, a crime punishable by death however they were granted a reprieve until the following January, pending an appeal, prolonging the agony of awaiting their fate. While in the city jail, John and Lavinia focused on plotting their escape, capitalizing on the lax security measures at the Charleston jail in a 6x8 cell that was not guarded enough. Their attempt on September 13, using a makeshift rope crafted from prison linens, ended in failure when the rope broke, leaving Lavinia trapped, while John briefly tasted freedom. Yet, his unwavering loyalty to his wife led him to forego his escape and return to her side, resulting in his prompt recapture. This failed escape only heightened the scrutiny surrounding the fissures and prompted authorities to tighten security measures around them. John and Lavinia now stood on the brink of a grim fate on February 4, 1820, as their appeals to the Constitutional Court were denied. The court's decision sealed their fate, condemning them both to be hanged for their crimes on February 18. Despite the gravity of their situation, John showed signs of remorse and sought solace in the counsel of Reverend Richard Furman, a local minister who offered spiritual guidance in their final hours, however Lavinia, perhaps consumed by bitterness or defiance, exhibited a more hostile demeanor, intensifying her vitriol as they awaited their impending execution. On the day of execution, John's complexion grew pallid, and his body shook uncontrollably with tremors. Reverend Richard Furman, standing before the gallows erected in front of the old city jail, read aloud a letter that John had composed. In this letter, John asserted his newfound Christian faith and proclaimed his innocence, declaring that he could not be executed with a lie held against him. He pleaded for mercy, asking forgiveness for any wrongs committed against him in the judicial process, however as the minister read the letter to the crowd of approximately 2,000 spectators, John took the opportunity to plead his case directly to the gathered audience. In a moment of apparent contradiction, he asked for forgiveness from those present, despite maintaining his innocence moments earlier. Despite his appeals and the seemingly dramatic scene unfolding before the crowd, no mercy was granted, and John met his end at the gallows. Infamously, Lavinia did not go quietly to her death. She adamantly refused to walk to the gallows and had to be carried there, all the while ranting and raving. Being aware of the legal loophole that prevented the execution of married women, she also initially hoped to save herself by revealing her marital status, however upon learning that her husband would be executed first, leaving her widowed and vulnerable to the gallows, she devised a daring plan. Lavinia insisted on wearing a wedding dress to her execution, hoping to entice a man into marrying her for her looks before the noose tightened around her neck. When this scheme failed and she realized her impending demise, she defiantly addressed the crowd, screaming, If you have a message you want to send to hell, give it to me, I'll carry it, I will be seeing the devil in a moment. This dramatic act occurred before a crowd of roughly 2,000 people, many of whom were left unsettled by the intensity of Lavinia's demeanor, describing her stare as wicked and her sneer as chilling. The couple both in their late twenties, met their fate on the gallows as their execution took place at 2 p.m. on February 18, 1820, marking the end of their chapter in criminal history. As reported by the Charleston Courier on February 19, Lavinia's death was swift, while John endured a few moments of agony before passing away. 
Subsequently, their lifeless bodies were taken down from the gallows and laid to rest in Potter's Field, located adjacent to the site of her hanging just outside the old city jail. Even after centuries of the sinister doings of Lavinia and her husband, the legend of Lavinia Fisher's ghost is a prominent aspect of South Carolina folklore, with numerous accounts detailing encounters with her spectral presence. According to legend, Lavinia's restless spirit is said to haunt various locations associated with her life and alleged crimes, including the old city jail where she was imprisoned and the vicinity of the former Six Mile House where she and her husband operated therein. Reports of encounters with Lavinia's ghost often describe her as a malevolent and vengeful spirit appearing as a woman in vintage attire with a haunting gaze. Some claim to have heard her disembodied voice or felt a chilling presence in locations linked to her story. Additionally, tales of inexplicable occurrences, such as sudden drops in temperature or unexplained noises, are frequently attributed to Lavinia's restless spirit. While skeptics dismiss these accounts as mere superstition or urban legend, the enduring fascination with Lavinia's ghost continues to captivate locals and visitors alike, contributing to her legacy as one of South Carolina's most enduring and enigmatic figures. Despite the passage of centuries, the tales of Lavinia's alleged crimes, the uncertainty surrounding her origins, and the enduring mythos of her ghost continue to intrigue and captivate. Whether viewed as a ruthless criminal mastermind or a victim of sensationalized storytelling, Lavinia's legacy endures as a testament to the enduring power of myth and the complexities of human nature. Her story serves as a cautionary tale, a glimpse into the darker corners of the human psyche, and a reminder that even the most notorious figures can become immortalized in the fabric of folklore and legend.